Hi everyone and welcome. Uh, we're hosting today's session as a member of VA Dundee Young People's Collective. Um, I'm Lizzie. We've also got with us today Louise, Rianne, Bethan, Fraser and Sonia. And we're also joined by Kirsty Hazard and Barry Maxwell of the Exhibitionist team. Um, we'll start by telling you about what the Young People's Collective do, then show you a 10 minute video and follow up with a Q&A session between YPC and the Exhibitionist guys. V&A Dundee is the first ever dedicated design museum in Scotland and the only other v &A museum anywhere in the world outside of London. The museum provides a place of inspiration, discovery and learning and its mission is to enrich lives through design. The Young People's Collective, or YPC as we're known, was formed in 2017, a year before the museum opened to the public. Our group ranges from 14 to 24 years old and we meet throughout the year every Thursday evening to get involved with lots of co-design processes and consult with the museum team on key decisions representing young people's voice. Over the past three years we've led different kinds of projects and programs. Before we had a museum building we started by meeting weekly off-site off to consult what the future programs for young people should include and we co-designed the V&A Dundee's televised Hughes opening 3D festival concert and a lighting and sound installation at the heart of the city. Since we've gone on to test and create the events delivered for and sometimes by young people, we've interpreted themes within the museum's spaces and exhibitions in ways that are relevant and interesting to us. We've selected and worked with designers from different areas to, of creative industries across disciplines like fashion, architecture, engineering, video games, illustration, and much more. With the learning team, we collaborated to co-produce whole museum design days, talks, interviews, and practical workshops. We've also worked with the exhibitions team, consulting on the content for upcoming projects, making installations and prototyping gallery activities and handling objects. Our group doesn't attend a programme that has been decided for us by someone else. We contribute ideas together and design our programme to make it work for us. We'd like to share one of the projects that we've led over the lockdown period. Since the museum closed in March, we've continued to meet every Thursday and YPC were invited to curate a section of the exhibition now accepting contactless, researching how designers have adapted in the global pandemic. Our section Imagining the Future examines how the pandemic has thrown up many problems for society and services and individuals. Design has offered solutions, but only by the thoughtful reflection that we can use the turning point as a catalyst to redesign for a better future. Face masks have become an essential part of life pre-pandemic. They were widely worn in some companies and fashion brands by in and independent makers, and we interpreted them as accessories, making them an important form of self-expression. As a group of six, we have selected masks that reflect this using Microsoft Teams and Zoom video calls to curate our own section from home. We'll now show you a video demonstrating part of how we researched and curated these objects. We'll see you soon. Been looking at imagining the future um, over the past couple of weeks. And um, I think what's been really clear, um, what's came out a couple of the chats is that, you know, there's this idea of face masks and, you know, how we've all been wearing face masks over the past couple of weeks and how they might, how we might change um, how we view them. And it was just to see, yeah, what your thoughts were on that and, yeah, the different masks that you might want to propose for that section. Louise, you've been working on two sections, haven't you? Yeah, so... Off of, from this section, I've been doing the healthcare section um, with a couple of people. So there's been a bit of crossover with this section and the healthcare section. So I've got a mask that I'm going to talk about um, that kind of links to the healthcare section as well. So this mask was made um, through somebody who works in Nine Wells. Something that we started talking about at the YPC meetings that like forcing the pandemic, like forcing out inequalities. And as able-bodied people, we've struggled with um, not having to touch things or having to wear masks and things, but as somebody with a disability, that must be even harder. So this guy who works in Nine Wells has developed this mask alongside this company, Breathe Easy, um, who have, he's made this plastic cover in the middle, so people can still lip read him when he goes into consultations with them. Um, and I think that the blue on the outside is the Tayside Teal, which was made by Holly Stevenson. 
well and the all the staff in nine wells have also got to side tail face masks anyway so like the ones that don't have the clear bit in the middle and they're all taste side teal as well I thought it was quite interesting this kind of whole thing of like as an able-bodied person it's hard enough but as somebody with a disability it must be even harder and this is something that he's experienced first with his patients and people he's been consulting with. Yeah that sounds great Louise and it would be a yeah a really important thing to include. I think Sonia you had seen something similar to that as well have you got any other designs that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, um, so I have seen one similar to that. So this is a designer. Um, she's a Chinese designer. She uh, makes the sneakers masks, um, which I think they're quite cool. And as well, um, she made this long before uh, the pandemic. She actually started making this um, because of the pollution in China. Um, and so I think it's quite nice how despite having a few years these are so relevant just now and then you can find like every single kind of like trainers that you can think of there's like supreme ones and an ikea one and supermarket one as well as salunga which is an italian supermarket um let me see if i can find it there you go up here and then the other thing that I saw that kind of crosses with what um, Louise was saying about like medical purposes. So there's this um, fabric that's been developed that has kind of like um, electrified fabric. So it has some kind of wiring, I suppose. Um, but um, this, this electrification actually kills the COVID. So by wearing this, uh, you, not immune, but it actually prevents the the contamination um, as well. Like with, um, if you touch, um, you know, the mask after you use it, and for some reason there's some like little particles of COVID or I don't really know scientific terms, but um, it, it kind of like stops that from happening. So I think these two are quite cool masks. Yeah, they're great. And it's really nice to see the parallels between the one that Louise showed um, and this one. And then, yeah, the really like fashion forward. Um, yeah, the other one as well. So showing something that's really functional, but yeah, something that's really fashionable too. You yeah, know, they're great. It's a nice crossover with this one box for the future as well. The reuse of different materials. Rianne, will we take a look at yours? Yeah. So I was focusing more on the uh, aesthetics as well. And uh, mine was uh, similar to like some box of the future where it was reusing like pre-existing um, materials and fabrics. So this one is from uh, a shop in America that repurposes designer clothing and designer accessories to make other clothing and in this case they've made a mask and so that's focusing on like high fashion even during a pandemic which I thought was interesting and then the second one I found was uh, these ones by another American designer and they replicate bird uh, beaks and they're made out of uh, leather so they're quite durable and I thought they were really interesting because well they're obviously very unique and uh, very bright and bold, but I also thought they kind of uh, replicated the Plague Doctor's masks um, with the, the beak style as well. So I thought they were quite relevant <laughs> again. And yeah, and Rianne, what I really like about um, those two is that, you know, you're really, I guess, as a person wearing them, you're really showing your identity mm -hmm. uh, through those masks. Yeah, it has a lot of like personality to yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, especially the bird beak ones. Yeah, yeah. I really like those. <laughs> yeah. So, Kashi, do you think we would be able to get any of the masks that we've seen so far? Yeah, um, I think we can either reach out to the lenders, or sorry, reach out to the makers of the masks um, in the first instance and ask whether they want to be part of the exhibition and then talk about whether that's um, lending to the exhibition or it's us uh, purchasing them. But yeah, no, I think they yeah, all sound really reasonable suggestions, yeah. 
So these are masks from Slange. So oh, yeah. they're doing tartan masks mm -hmm. and, and raising money for the shelter. Yep. So it's been pretty good. So the front of the mask is 100% wool. Mm. So I uh, thought that was quite cool. And then it's been kind of known to be the mask that Nicola Sturgeon wears when she's in Parliament. And then I found another one by a designer down in Nigeria, which is also focusing on kind of heritage mm -hmm. prints to do with heritage. A designer called Hedaya. Those are amazing. Yeah, has been doing loads of West African prints inspired ones. So she's got blue ones, teal ones, and I think on their been advertised on her Instagram and she's saying that I think it's along the lines of her inspiration was a change to the new normal mm -hmm. within fashion during lockdown so kind of using loose fitting clothes and the masks. Yeah no, they're great mm -hmm. really really good suggestions yeah and um, I really like how the but yeah I guess both of them speak to identity as well um, in their own ways and it's really nice how a lot of the masks you've suggested that theme of identity is yeah is running through them. I came across the mask like the idea of the protests going on in America right now to do with George Floyd's and um, the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. and this kind of like cross section of like that's been going on some of the pandemic and it's really risky for people to go out um, and meet in like large groups of people um, whilst there's a pandemic going on but it's kind of a really important issue so it's kind of the risk of that and this is, I find I thought it was like a pretty neat cross section of those two ideas in that kind of the same way the similar ideas of how clothes and fashion are pretty political or can be used to kind of make a statement yep. and I think it's a pretty interesting way of making a statement while staying safe or being able to go out and protest like a very important issue I think yep. and also like a useful like if they were in the um, exhibition they'd be useful like conversation Point to kind of get people talking about the issues. Like likewise in like the UK, so there's this like decolon decolonialization stuff that's been going on right now, mm -hmm. which is also quite an important conversation to have. Um, yeah, no, yeah, and I um, absolutely agree. I think it's yeah, really important mask. Um, and yeah, really important that we can hopefully include that as well. Yeah, it's a really great suggestion. So are there any ones that anyone feels like we definitely have to try and include them in the exhibition selection? So, Kirsty, how many will we be able to have? Um, I was thinking six. Um, I think six is probably a pretty good number to have a yeah, cross-section of ones from hopefully different countries, which yeah, you've, I think what's been really nice about today is the fact that yeah, there's like a global representation um, in the mass that you've chosen. Um, so yeah, ideally I would like yeah, six from different parts of the world, uh, different colours, different patterns. Definitely there's no more masks. Yeah. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of my one from Slange. I think it's good that it's kind of keeping it at home. And, yep. mm -hmm. and I think as well the Louise's one, because yeah. just I think it's a uh, it's just important, and a lot of times we really don't think much of like other people's oh. needs. Yep. So. Yeah, and the importance of accessibility, which I think a lot of people have probably, yeah, forgotten about with mask wearing and how that takes away a really important part of how people communicate. Um, yeah, and it'll be really good to include that one. Beacon the sneaker ones, I think, so that they have like such a different shape and colour scheme that is different from just the plain surgical masks that yep. most people are wearing. The Black Lives Matter mask is pretty important just to kind of highlight something else that's been happening, like another ma massive thing that's been happening this summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as well, I think from a fashion point of view, it's quite interesting how we used to have like graphic tees and like that's where you would put like your slogans or whatever you wanted people to see. And now that kind of shifted towards, you know, making graphic masks in a sense. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that and yeah, having the slange one because it's nice to, although it's great to have all these global examples, it's great to reference that there's been some really creative solutions uh, going on pretty close to home too. Yeah. Um, yeah, that all sounds great. So I think maybe our next steps for next time are uh, having a chat about how we approach the designers, um, and then yeah, we can we can take it from there. But yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks. Right, see you later.
<laughs> so your contribution to the imagining the future section was um, invaluable and I think it's made lots of people including the exhibitions team and visitors really think a different way about the exhibition. Uh, so Vary and I have got a couple of questions um, that we'd like to ask you about the objects and about your contribution. I mean, as because you've called it imagining the future, I guess my first question would be, um, what you think um, the key things that you hope will change for good in a post-COVID world? So what do you hope our new normal will look like? I'll take it. Go on. <laughs> Um, so I think from a young person perspective is the inclusivity because we really saw it even just in the the um, way in which we, we co-curated the exhibition we had because we were online doing the, all the sessions we had part of our young people's group that wasn't participating anymore because they, they moved for university or whatever and and because it was online they were actually involved in the process because they just had to have an internet connection and and just show up so um no matter what's gonna happen like if uh, everything will stay online or if we won't have to and we can meet in person those that are far will be able to come and join us i think i think it'll be interesting to see like in the future what kind of like efficiency will be retained because there was so many like decisions that were made and things that happened with such efficiency because it had to happen during yeah. the pandemic and it, like all the kind of decisions that were made in hospitals and yeah. like creation of an exhibition that happened and all these kind of decisions that were made and it'll be interesting to see if that kind of efficiency is retained I think across like all hundreds of different areas um, I think that would be really interesting to see what, and I think as well like aspects of community I think would be interesting how things like people are putting flyers through each other's doors for shopping and things like that so I think that would be interesting to see if that carries on as well. I do I do think though because we discussed a lot during the curation process about like a positive future and a negative future and kind of that, that dualism um, I think um, it would be good if the more negative sides of what happened will not continue because that is the risk as well the things have changed and in from one side like louise was saying things were more efficient but then from the other side they weren't because they were so rushed as well so um my worry or hope is that those will not continue and that they will stop and you know and in that sense we will go back to what we did before for those kind of things or we'll find new solutions i think with the panic especially lockdown has definitely made us think is take a step back and just look upon stuff even if that is good or bad um i think at any point you could have looked to the future and thought hmm, this is interesting but because of being in a house for six months and not knowing what to do has really gone hmm what are we now going to do <laughs> yeah. is the main point and how are we going to move forward from that and i think that's what really led to creating especially an exhibition like this is that the what is going to happen you know so it's been quite a nice process then for you guys to be a part of then in terms of being a bit more reflective or introspective or kind of trying to kind of take a kind of like a stock take of of everything that's happened and then trying to repurpose that to think a bit more creatively in the future would you say that's that's maybe a positive experience you felt by being part of this curation process yeah i, t I totally agree that's really cool so yeah what i wanted to ask was um what areas of design do you think need more talented young minds to help bring about this change big one for me was the environmental impact of COVID. Like, I, it's something we discussed in the Imagine the Future um, section, is that, that we're only really now getting to like this idea of fabric masks and, and having masks to keep and reuse and wash. And I think in that first initial months, especially when masks were made to be compulsory in Scotland, like we weren't um, immediately seeing that. We were seeing a lot of PPE and, and non-recyclable versions of that. And mm -hmm. I think there's definitely steps to be made that we can come up with a different system. I totally understand where the need for non-recyclable PPE is. And obviously in medical spaces, it's totally necessary in the same way that 
plastic straws are still necessary in hospitals like you can't replace that so easily but I think there's definitely a wider conversation that needs to keep happening there if we're going to make a change from it yeah. and I and I think that every area of designs needs young people because mm-hmm. that, that is the point isn't it is that there's a new generation and that has a new perspective and maybe is going to push more for climate change and x and y and z and so you need it in every area so that the change happens everywhere because otherwise part of the society will accept it and the other part doesn't even know that it's happening so I agree with that I would say that like for something to like be designed well I think you need to have consultation and like so you wouldn't design something for somebody who is disabled without consultation with a disabled person on how it's used efficiently and how yeah and how that would be made so why would you design something for a young person or for young people who are going to be using these things or going to be like the future of I was going to say the world because that's so cheesy but it is it, like without consultation of like how that's going to be implemented or used it doesn't seem doesn't really make sense I think young people need to be consulted and kind of in every area of design it just seems like it makes sense as I say yeah it's like not as easy as as saying like oh when I was young it was like this because I think now we are all accepting that like every single young person's life is so different to the previous generation's young person life like it is literally changing year to year like when I was 16 is not how people who are 16 now are even living and that was Mm -hmm. only so many years apart and it's just it needs to be an acceptance of that in the design industry as well and therefore a constant communication with young people to help build products for them and for wider groups as well. And I think young people as we're known to be just kind of not revolutionary but kind of thinking forward we can definitely help make that design process more simple if that makes sense also revolutionary that's like a keyword and if you think of the past six months and the big revolutions that have happened not you know over the summer so the black lives matter movement and the environment the kind of rise of um, Extinction Rebellion again and um, environmentalism um, that's driven by young people um, and so I think that's really great is to think about how design is more engaging on those activists um, in that activist way. Cool. <laughs> and there's a little add on to that question so um Over the past couple of months, or even before, have any of you been inspired to pursue careers as designers or be more involved in design as a career? Well, I think design is such like a an open kind of workforce that there's so many different types of design that you could be working in any industry and doing design. And design is such an important part of just sort of human life and human nature we want to sort of improve what we're doing constantly and it takes design to do that so i yeah i'd say that no matter what industry i would be interested in working in um i think i would want to focus on design within those industries mm-hmm. i think as well as that it's such a broad spectrum that you could find any job necessarily and like you said find a job in design but as well as that you can find stuff to tell a story within what has happened and then design something around that to solve an issue like like I've experienced this and that during this time how could I design something to make that better or how can I find a way to pursue a career that that will be worth it that makes quite sense. empowering mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that was what I found quite interesting about the um interviews that we did with the nine wells staff in the yeah. healthcare section and they were um not designers they were medical yeah. staff and they had had undertaken collaborations with designers but they were having they were they were more effective designs because they were designing for problems that they've encountered and rather than somebody else coming in and giving them a solution saying this will help your problem and they were having to create a solution for a problem that they were having so that, that it was more effective if that makes sense mm. don't know if I'm that very well yeah, that <laughs> so makes like through, yeah so through collaborations that they were 
kind of undertaken themselves that the solutions were much more effective and I thought that was really interesting that I think that's something as well that would be a positive change coming out of the pandemic would be all these kind of collaborations that have had to that have just had to happen that have created all these kind of really positive outcomes I think across all these different industries I think that would be something positive to come out of it as well. Uh, definitely. Um, continuing mm -hmm. from what Louise is saying, um, I got closer to the design world um, in the last period, specifically to the disciplines of user experience design and service design, which are very interesting because, uh, I mean, I have um, a business background, so it kind of it, it kind of puts a business aspects in it, but then you also have like the design and the creative kind of side of it, um, and maybe people wouldn't really think of it as like a design disciplines because uh, when you think of design you think more of like an object that's been created uh, out of your imagination um, but they are at the base of what Louise was saying at the end of the day is the creation of things um, that um, have affect the experience of someone um, and one of the basic principles of it is the the design thinking and how it, it should happen in multidisciplinary teams and so having people that come from different backgrounds and from different disciplines all working together to using the design thinking to create something that works for the end user um which is i, I think at, at the end of the day at the base of everything if you want to have something that actually works for the person that you want the, to, them to have the thing you will have to think creatively um, and think in a different way in order to really use all the potential and not just give the the thing that always happens because if people thought in the same way during the pandemic a lot of solutions wouldn't have been there we would have been stuck next question um so uh, I don't know if many of you know that I actually trained as an archaeologist and was like my degrees and so on were in archaeology. So of course, I'm going to ask you what you think archaeologists in 500 years or something time might think when they stumble upon those uh, discarded face masks <laughs> underneath the tarmac. Um, so what kind of like material culture over the past six months do you think are they going to dig up? What are the main objects you think archaeologists of the future are going to find in this time? Well, I think like Lizzie said earlier, at the start of the pandemic, it was a focus on we need PPE and we need it as fast as we can because everyone needs access to it like right now. So we weren't focusing on the sustainability of it. So I think a lot of that is what's going to be, uh, that's what's going to get kept, that's what's going to stick around. Whereas all the sort of more recent advancements and the uh, fabric face masks that people have made, um, they're not going to be left behind because people will be reusing them and wearing them and keeping them until they don't need them anymore. Whereas the paper ones and the plastic ones will just be tossed out after one use. So I think that's kind of what's going to be left behind was the sort of first wave sort of like what we needed when we needed it yeah mm. I like that joke that um I don't know if it's a joke or more serious but like it uh, the archaeologists they find an abundance of one thing you could consider it like having religious connotations because mm -hmm. of the past like this. <laughs> people gonna think we have like a religious yeah. connection to face masks and <sighs> <past models. laughs> yeah, exactly. just the idea and, yeah, I think I weirdly it's in plastic bottles. Obviously, like the bottles themselves are recyclable, but it's always the pumps that are, yep. this, that are so hard to dispose of. So I can see like a recycling plan with just like a corner of pumps, and like that's all that's left is just one portion of a sanitizer bottle. Not even the full thing. Like it's a cracked vase, and we're missing pieces of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I think um, what would be quite interesting to think about is how many, how much more like things people have created over this amount of time because yeah. i can imagine there's a lot of painting and a lot of yeah. like writing pottery. and pottery there's a good example <laughs> um, knitting, knitting sewing. everything <laughs> <Yeah>. sourdough bread <laughs> yeah. 
And Somebody once the baking tray has been discarded over a hedge. Like, yeah. Sort of and when, when archaeologists think about like different time periods and stuff, they'll just go like, that was made in the pandemic. And that's quite interesting to me. That um, loaf of bread was so badly made, it will never decompose. <laughs> <laughs> Turned into carbon, it was so burnt. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, Amazon packaging and home mm -hmm. delivery notes and <laughs> things like that, potentially. Oh, super interesting. Oh, yeah. The next one. So um, the exhibition looks at, I suppose, the idea of how coronavirus has highlighted inequalities um, around the world. And one of the inequalities is obviously people living with disability. Um, and one of the objects that you chose for your section was the Seeing AI app. And I wonder if, yeah, you could talk about the role that you think design can play in helping people with disabilities. I think that connects really nicely back to us talking about um, working with young people to create products for young people in the same yeah. way that creating products with disabilities, you have to work with people with disabilities, yeah. otherwise you're not gonna make a product that works. Um, mm -hmm. And I think seeing AI is a really good example of that because um, Saqib from Microsoft, who's sort of the lead developer on that app, is partially sighted. And so therefore is creating an app for a community that he's well a part of and mm -hmm. understands. I think it's really important because like, to I think more people kind of with disabilities or more young people and all these kind of areas need to be involved in design because like the world is like built for kind of like one genre of people and you don't really notice it until you're forced to not until you're forced to think about it like it wasn't until we kind of stumbled across the seeing ai app and we thought like it's hard enough for us to not touch things but like what if you navigate the world by touch like how, how do you even navigate the world anymore and um, like i had seen an article just the other week actually and it was about partially sighted people and they were talking about how during the pandemic, everybody started opening doors like um, with the wheelchair button but with their feet. Um, and this was a big problem because people in wheelchairs still had to obviously use their hands. Mm -hmm. um, so all these kinds of things about, you know, how, if, I don't know, just how able-bodied able, pe able -bodied people kind of also make use of these things, but often in the wrong way and how the world is made for able-bodied people, but they can still they can still make use of the ways that the world is sometimes catered for people that aren't able-bodied. I think it's quite interesting. It's like almost like we're taking advantage of things that haven't been designed for us, but because they're in our space, we feel like we can. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask about another object. Um, well, a series of objects. Um, uh, the face masks, um, which you chose um, to include in the exhibition, and I wanted to ask how you went about selecting them. When we were looking for masks, I think a lot of us were thinking along the lines of um, like fast fashion, which became a solution to sort of uh, expensive tailor-made clothes. And so the fast fashion of masks became uh, a solution to the PPE. Uh, so they were just uh, ready, uh, readily available on, you know, like street markets. Um, and sort of thinking like how in sneaker shops there's walls of sneakers what it would look like if there was like a, a, a shop that had that for masks and I remember thinking back to when uh, the sort of like the loom bands and this fidget spinners were like a big deal and they became like really popular you would find street markets and every other stall was selling just those and so it was sort of similar in the sense that uh, everyone was wanting them and everyone was needing them. And so they had to become fashionable so that they could sell. And it was um, like a lot of companies were obviously like uh, taking that on and realizing, well, if people are going to be buying face masks because they're a necessity, then we might as well be making them and, you know, putting a designer label on them and selling them for a lot. So that's what I was sort of uh, interested in looking at. And, but obviously there was a lot of independent designers just making ones that they thought they were interesting, which was uh, just really unique and just as fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the masks will be um, staying as long as they're needed. 
it is a trend that may go away but because it's a trend that started out of necessity it's going to stay until it's useful for sure at least um and then maybe um later on some people will keep on using it as a fashion statement some people won't um and the from the activist perspective um i think fashion has always been um kind of like a place where people speak their mind uh, if you look at vivian westwood or just like graphic tees and and you can name so many um so obviously the masks as well they will have um their, their say uh, in a sense and um that is like for example one of the masks that we included in the exhibition the black lives matter one you know obviously people see your face first thing they see is your face and if you have to wear a mask and you want to say something write it on a mask um it's just two plus two isn't it so <laughs> <laughs> um it, it's not quite wearing it on your sleeve it's wearing it on your face <laughs> yes it's literally the first thing that people will see is like you believe this or like this is your political position this is your values or whatever you're trying to convey um, and for the sustainability what Rian was saying I think it's it's very true that you always have like the fast fashion side of um the the masks but you also will have uh, people actually trying to buy masks that they can use and reuse and wash and they're made you know ethically or the so part of the revenue will go to charities for example one of the masks that we included the isolated heroes one um it was something around i think 15 pounds but five of these pounds will go to a charity and they raised thousands of pounds in for charities so you know some people will make the conscious decision some people won't pre-pandemic the masks were still being worn in countries and where it was needed and i think if it if it was being worn before then after covid has come into a lull it will still be worn it's not like it's a thing that has only existed because of coronavirus it's just been like push to more and if you think about it if it is used if it's going to be used people want it to look nice people just like like how things look and if it is just blue and plain not that attractive if people want something better then they're going to buy it so it's just a point of that it's basically a closing folk uh, especially fashion in a sense and how it's being used now um to just prove points and other things but yeah yeah i think it's worth like off the back of that because i think it's worth like mentioning that like it's not a new idea like <clears throat> just because it's new to the uk and new to europe doesn't mean that other parts of the world haven't been wearing face masks as fashion items for you know decades um and i think the selection in the exhibition is like a like a cross section of it. it there's accessible pieces in there by design or accessible in cost but you've also got pieces like the toucan mask <laughs> it's obviously you know really fascinating and interesting but practically as a as a face covering in 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 the sense of covid is maybe not doesn't actually work in the same way but it's it's still a really interesting conversation about fashion coming into a health sector which is really cool mm -hmm. yeah and as well from that um the, the other mask that we have, which is the sneakers mask, is a mask that's been made years ago, actually, uh, because the designer is a Chinese designer. And so she was reflecting on the pollution uh, in China and people wearing masks in China and then giving it a spin from um, a fashion perspective and a design perspective. And so that is the, the prime example of what Fraser was saying, that other countries have been dealing with this already and it's just that now it's more widely spread but obviously people have been having these thoughts prior to us. I've been quite liking to think about it like how like I think everyone just touched on it but we've been talking about it in the sense of like shoes how you get shoes shoes are practical so like why would you not want them to look nice as well and like you get shoes which are completely functional but then you also get shoes which are completely ridiculous and really expensive like the chicken mask would be but mm. there would also be a reason at some point to wear shoes like that like somebody would want an occasion to wear a ridiculously high 
stiletto heels which cost loads of money like people would still buy these things in the same way that I think people would maybe maybe not yet but in the future at some point and also maybe in different countries as well buy these masks which cost a lot of money to us and maybe it wouldn't seem like the best idea for masks for us to buy yet but I think would still have a purpose and a function the same way that shoes would I think it's quite interesting comparison I've been finding. Going on to what Lizzie said about how it's fashion entering health sector the only other example I can really think of is that you know when you get a cast on your leg or your arm if you've broken your arm yeah. and people go sign it it's like you don't want a plain white cast you want to have some advertising on it you know what about today actually was um because I was in the museum and looking at the Mary Quant exhibition I was thinking about how like the tights and Mary Quants often match well. the outfit and I was thinking about like face masks matching outfits at the moment and it's like <laughs> a weird reverse of that even just now, a lot of designers are selling, you know, face masks and scrunchie mats. And, yeah, know. totally. I think it's a good way to express yourself and be like, this is me. And then other people will know. But it's good to be like, oh, I'm wearing this, like, red dress. I'll wear this whatever colour mask to go with it. So then I'm not only looking great, but I'm being safe. Yeah. So like, Looking great and being safe, yes. <laughs> um, I think we're on to the last question now. Yeah, final question. Um, so it's an easy one. Um, what are your favourite objects in the exhibition? Or in your section, sorry. Or if you want. Or it could be the whole exhibition, but yeah. <laughs> I love the Burger King crown so much. I think it's amazing. <laughs> I gaze at it every day. I think it's <laughs> Explain what that is again. Oh, the Burger King crown is, um, well, it was a marketing thing from Burger King, I think in the Philippines, is that correct? And it's uh, yeah. uh, 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 Germany and Singapore, I think. Or I think it was Singapore. It was Singapore. And it's, and it's uh, to mark two metre distancing. So it's a massive Burger King crown. But it was made by one of the freelancers for the exhibition to sort of represent the piece because obviously it was a marketing ploy and it's long gone. But like that's, I mean, it was, it's so fun. I love it. And every single day, that's where kids go to. They beeline it to it when they come up. <laughs> so like gold and wonderful. Yeah. And yeah, it's fab. I love that thing. My one is the sneakers mask. It's just... Is just genius in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way about the bird beat mask because I just think it was really great. It's sort of play on the plague doctors of um, humanity's last pandemic <laughs> and uh, also just representing actual bird beaks where bird beaks would be on the face and I just thought it was really cool. <laughs> and it, they were bright and colourful and it kind of um, it was a nice sort of difference to the sort of bleak, just kind of standard surgical masks that uh, at that point it was what everyone was wearing. And I think also really nice too because they're all handcrafted as well, like how they're made in a studio by like one person essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's like going away from that idea of masks being like, yeah, mass produced, which I think can. I guess that's a good thing about that section. There is a hint of the both of yeah things that are mass produced and things that are, yeah are handcrafted, um, which is why I really like it because you can obviously see like the you know that the hand stitching in it and how it's been really yeah really beautifully pieced together. I really liked the tartan mask. I thought that was a good one. I think it was because it kind of had. I feel like to me it's a bit of a sense of identity as well as like they were raising money for Shelter Scotland and that kind of being kind of people buying masks are not only protecting themselves but they're kind of given a reason for other people who are homeless to kind of support them throughout this process which wouldn't have been easy. I think I must say I'm quite biased but I really like the Nine Mills interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm only saying that because I do find them, I find it really interesting speaking to those people from Nine Wells. I think it was really important and quite interesting. And then off the back of that, I really find the, was it the tea, the tea hood or the tea, what was it called again? Yeah, the tea hood. The tea hood. Yeah, I think that's really that's interesting amazing. and quite important as well. Was, yeah, that idea of like design as, as collaboration and how it was yeah. um, 
like textile producers and medical professionals that came together to find a solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Tehud, yeah, this piece of PPE basically um, for rapid response paramedics to use when they have to administer CPR to patients. So obviously in the time of a pandemic, they couldn't, um, for example, give mouth to mouth without putting on lots of PPE first. So this Tehud is actually a barrier that goes over the patient immediately and it drastically reduces response time and means that, you know, the healthcare um, paramedics can get right on on to saving that person's life so it's a pretty crucial bit of design um, a pretty kind of acute problem that perhaps wasn't anticipated until you know this um, pandemic which is quite, quite frightening really um, it was a problem yeah. which was global as well but like this was the only solution that was made in Dundee yeah yep. so. and it's going to be open source doesn't it and mm -hmm. pr provided as as affordably as possible globally is the ambition so yeah i think that's a really nice example i think my one would maybe be the hospital bed um which um is quite a troubling object and i find it really um uh difficult to talk about but um i think it was really important to include so this is a cardboard hospital bed which we have been kindly donated by the designers themselves from who are based in Bogota in Colombia and they created this cardboard hospital bed um, out of sheer kind of almost as a piece of speculative design um, so they didn't want it to really be a reality that it would need to be used but the case numbers of Covid there were just exponentially rising at the time um, and this was seen as a very cheap um, solution um, for overcrowding in hospitals um, but it also doubles as a coffin and I think that's what's really um, heartbreaking about it and it's even more troubling to think that it's actually now in use um, and um, yeah this is an object that they hoped wouldn't be in use but now unfortunately um, is now um, being used in real uh, community in kind of real life um, in communities across Colombia and actually globally. So I think it was really important for us to also tell a kind of global story as well. Anyone else got a object? Um, I like the was it uh, Nathan's the computer uh, aspect because that was mm -hmm. I thought it was quite provoking in the sense that we created that kind of object um, through the computer. We did it as <laughs> as example of ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. So how, explain what it is a bit more. Was it uh, the how he had a Zoom call going um, on the computer, like in real time, just in the exhibition space itself yeah. um, with the other one? Um, and I thought it was just a good example of how we created the whole uh, imagining the future section ourselves and what that really meant uh <laughs> like a good end point not end point but a good statement that we were able to make for that so i thought it was quite, quite meta i like yeah <laughs> <laughs> great um thank you very much guys that was wonderful and really nice to have like those conversations again that we haven't had for a wee while in regards to this exhibition and bring all that to the forefront again. Um, yeah. I think I would just mention that we are doing a Twitter Q&A with this talk, which will be from seven o'clock on Saturday, the 24th of October. Well, I've learned loads from this conversation and I, thanks for letting us pick your brains on how you curated your part of the exhibition. Yeah. Um, uh, for all those watching, please do come and see it. It's on until May next yep. year, 2021. <laughs> so you've got plenty of time and it's free. It's in our free spaces. You just need to book online for a slot to come visit the V&A Dundee. Wow, thank you so much, everybody. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.